Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope that everyone is feeling adequately filled and ready for our keynote today. I'm really delighted that we were able to land, and I say land because she's a big fish, <laughs> that we were able to land Christine Grant as our keynote speaker. As many of you know, we had originally asked Lisa Bluter to be our keynote speaker, and she had agreed to do so. Um, you may also know that she had to go out of town very unexpectedly for delightful reasons. Our own Samantha Logic, who has been a Logic, who has been a star on our basketball team, was drafted for the WNBA yesterday. <laughs> she was selected 10th, the first round pick. So we are pretty delighted and proud and happy for her. And so Lisa wanted to be there, well, needed to be there with, Lisa, with Sam and her family for the draft pick. So we certainly do understand. But at the time that we'd asked Lisa, we actually had gone back and forth a little bit because we thought, oh, what about Christine? <laughs> We'd love to have Christine talk. So I feel in some ways that we're getting the best of both worlds and all worlds, but I think we're getting the best here in having Christine with us today. So I'm very grateful to her. I could really go on and on about Christine's accomplishments. In fact, I could do the whole lunchtime session about Christine's accomplishments. <laughs> and somebody does need to write the biography at some point in time. And she's going to shoot me after all of this, but that's OK. <laughs> because she herself is incredibly humble, and her accomplishments are many and great. And she has really been a pioneering trailblazer for women. But I just want to briefly point out that Christine has really been a pioneer in intercollegiate athletics in the US. She was the first women's athletic director at the University of Iowa in 1973. And in her 27 years at the helm of a separate women's athletic department, Christine helped coaches develop highly competitive teams at the national level and at the conference level where they won 27 Big Ten Conference titles. Christine is a native of Scotland, and she's earned national acclaim, and I should say international acclaim, for her dedication to gender equity in athletics. She has testified on Title IX and gender equity before several US House, US House of Representatives subcommittees and she served as an expert witness in many Title IX lawsuits. And she's provided me with invaluable information about Title IX over the years that I've been here. She served as president of both the Association for Inter Intercollegiate Athletics for Women and the National Association for Collegiate Women's Athletic Administrators. Christine has been inducted into the State of Iowa Women's Hall of Fame and the National Association of Collegiate Directors of Athletics Hall of Fame. She has received numerous awards, including the NCAA President Gerald R. Ford Award, the Billie Jean King Contribution Award, and being named National Administrator of the Year by the NACWAA and the Women's Basketball Coaches Association. Today, her session the need for women in decision-making positions will give you some irreplaceable insight to her success as well as to her brilliance. Please join me in welcoming Christine Grant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, today, I'd like to give you first a preamble to my presentation so that you understand where I'm coming from. When I retired as athletic director in the year 2000, I continued to work in the graduate program until 2006, teaching and advising students who were interested in athletic administration. And I also continued my research which traced the participation opportunities for girls and women in sport at the high school and the collegiate level. And in addition, I conducted a regular analysis of the allocation of financial resources to men and women in intercollegiate sport. But gradually over the last few years, 
I've turned all of my national presentations on Title IX over to my very last PhD student, who now not only does these presentations across the country, but actually has just very recently been hired by the NCAA, which is wonderful. So today, while I still work a little with the NCAA on gender equity issues, I've really freed myself to branch out into other areas of interest to me. And these areas deal primarily with issues of concern to girls and women. For several years, I've been on the Rape Victim Advocacy Advisory Committee, where I very quickly learned how pervasive the problem of violence against women is in our country and also throughout the world. And a few years ago, I was appalled to read the following statement by Nicholas Kristof, who with his wife has done extensive research in this area. Gender violence is one of the world's most common human rights abuses. Women worldwide ages 15 through 44 are more likely to die or be maimed because of male violence than because of cancer plus malaria plus war plus traffic accidents combined. Isn't that shocking? In the last couple of years, I've also become involved in the Iowa Women's Foundation, whose mission is to empower girls and women in Iowa and whose actions do just that. The leaders of this organization are not concerned with rhetoric. They are committed to creating solutions that will achieve their goals. They are most definitely action-oriented. Additionally, I have become passionate about the 5050 in 2020 organization whose goal is to have equitable representation of women at all levels of government in Iowa by the year 2020. These are the primary causes of concern to me and today I want to explain why my life experiences have convinced me to now put my energy and my effort into getting women into key decision-making positions. One of the most influential books that I have ever read is called In a Different Voice by Carl Gilligan. And in it, she writes, the women's movement has encouraged women to take their own thoughts more seriously rather than to assume that if they see things differently from men, they must be wrong. It's that concept that I want to talk about today. Back in 1962, I was selected as the Canadian national field hockey coach and therefore had the opportunity to participate in international field hockey. Women's field hockey at that time was not an Olympic sport. In the early 1930s, field hockey had actually applied to become an Olympic sport but was denied. So the women decided they would start their own international tournament. And every four years, teams from many nations traveled to the host country for the games. For over 40 years, these tournaments were held all over the world and they were organized by the International Federation of Women's Hockey Associations, the IFWHA which was composed of women from many countries. The tournaments were funded by the administrators and the athletes themselves. They had no financial help from other organizations or from governments. From my experiences in that organization, the IFWHA, I observed that the goal of promoting real friendship and understanding among women of different nationalities and races was of primary importance to the leadership of IFWHA. 
Equally significant was the belief that the true purpose of playing was the experience of the game itself, as opposed to the more tangible and extrinsic factors such as medals, trophies and rankings. These latter symbols, although common characteristics of traditional sport, were not characteristics of this international organisation. Perhaps the most amazing characteristic of the IFWHA was the fact that the international tournament was deliberately structured to avoid the emergence of a champion. This was not a traditional world championship. But before you dismiss this characteristic as totally unrealistic, may I remind you that in our nation we have managed to live quite happily with the fact that there's no true national champion in collegiate football. <laughs> <laughs> One of the great advantages of the IFWHA was that because we were organizing only one sport, we could accommodate many teams at our international tournament. In Canada in 1979, I think we had 30 national teams in attendance, whereas in the Olympic Games, only 12 hockey teams are allowed to participate. The most important fact about this story is that when women were left to govern their own sport, they chose to do so in a manner that was significantly different from men. I believe the demise of the organisation started when a couple of governments, which were almost exclusively male then, began to fund their women's teams to the international tournament. But in return, they demanded, and I mean demanded, a ranking of how their teams were performing against the rest of the world. And the women had deliberately avoided such a system. At almost the same time, and because of the resurgence of the women's movement in the 1960s, the cry for equality for women in sport was being heard. To many female athletes, equality meant access to the glory, the prestige, and the rewards to individuals participating in the Olympic Games. However, access to the Olympics also mandated an acceptance of the traditional structure of sport competition. Once started, the move toward a traditional championship structure in the IFWHA came quickly and almost quietly. In the 1971 conference in New Zealand, there was a considerable demand from some athletes to move toward a traditional championship in which a winner would be declared. For such a massive change, the debate was short, and though an impassioned plea for the retention of the organization and its values were made by a few people, the majority of women there, including me, remained silent. I know I just felt incapable of articulating these elusive values. Perhaps some of us were suspecting ourselves of holding 19th century values as some of our athletes had charged. Or perhaps we assumed that to see things differently from men meant we were wrong. Whatever the reason, through silence we failed to uphold our values and we accepted traditional male model of sport. To this day I have regretted my silence because we lost both the IFWHA and the international tournament. Looking back, I think I failed to speak up for the preservation of the organization because I had never really clarified in my own mind what my philosophy of sport was. However, after the demise of the organization, I gave considerable thought to that question and eventually became at peace with my philosophical framework. Strangely enough, after the 1971 IFWHA conference, when the structure had been changed to ensure a winner would be declared, 
I decided my dissertation topic for my PhD would be to determine to what extent men and women agreed or disagreed on the desirable characteristics of collegiate sport in the USA. The results of my study in 1974 showed that significant differences did indeed exist between men and women on how intercollegiate sport should be run. In brief, I had discovered that there was a gender gap in what constituted desirable characteristics of sport in our educational institutions. This is really interesting because little or nothing was being said about a gender gap in political views of men and women until the next decade, that would be the 1980s. In the mid to the late 60s, when field hockey athletes in the IFWHA were demanding changes in the international tournament, collegiate women in our country were also starting to question why they were being denied intercollegiate athletic competition that their brothers had enjoyed for decades. In response, the Association for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women was founded, that's the AIW, an organization designed to organize and implement national championships for collegiate women. It's almost eerie that in the very next year, 1972, Title IX was passed by Congress, the law prohibiting discriminatory practices in all of our educational institutions. So AIW was founded in 71 and Title IX was passed in 72. Like the IFWHA, the AIW was comprised primarily of women and they set out to create a national, regional and state system to organize championships for women. 10 years later, in 1980, the AIW had more institutional members than the NCAA and an organization had been created by women that was significantly different in its philosophy and its practices than the NCAA, which had been developed exclusively by men for men. Time demands that I cite only a few of these differences. The welfare of the student athlete was cited as the primary focus of the AIW, and an analysis of the rules pertaining to the student athlete will attest to this fact. Like the IFWHA, the AIW believed that the real value of the sport experience lay with the student's ability to extract from sport knowledge of self and values that pertained to self. To achieve this goal, it was necessary to try to create for student athletes a non-exploitive approach to the sport experience. The rules pertaining to students which included the Student Athletes Bill of Rights, were examples of this attempt to create a non-exploitive approach. Additionally, the AIW voted to have at least 20% of national committee positions allocated for student athletes, with both voice and with vote. What better way to avoid the exploitation of student athletes? It's ironic that today student athletes are demanding representations on NCAA committees when female student athletes had these opportunities more than 40 years ago with the AIW. Moreover, since the AIW had encouraged all institutions to create student athlete advisory committees on each campus, the student athlete voice should not have been lost in the debate on all policies. In another key area, the executive board in 1980 voted to have at least 20% of its members on all national committees allocated for minorities. Even today, the NCAA has nothing comparable to the 20% requirements for student athlete representation or for minority representation. Nor, to my knowledge, has there ever even been a discussion on the need for a Student Athletes Bill of Rights, which the AIW had passed over 30 years ago. 
An unusual characteristic of the organisation was the fact that any individual institution had the right to appeal any decision by the AIW, and we had almost 1,000 institutions. But the most amazing characteristic was the fact that any student had that same right of appeal, and we had over 100,000 student-athletes. The NCAA today offers no such due process system. From an athlete's standpoint, another significant characteristic was the fact that every member institution could elect to have all of its teams participate in the AIW post-season opportunities. All teams were welcome, and the competition was set up within each state, then within each region, and then in national championships. So it was an inclusive and relatively inexpensive system that permitted all teams to play their way to the very highest levels. Suffice to say again that when women were left to their own devices to create a system, their system and their policies were significantly different from that of the NCAA. A coincidence? I don't think so. I think that like the IFWHA, the AIW structure and philosophy was a manifestation of the gender gap in sport. The demise of the AIW came when, despite opposition from almost all women in the organization and many men in the AIW, the NCAA voted to start women's championships in all divisions and, as an incentive, offered to pay all expenses to the championships, an incentive the AIW could not match at that stage in its existence. In other words, the NCAA bought their way into women's intercollegiate athletics. Why was the NCAA determined to start women's championships? In my opinion, since the NCAA had failed to totally eliminate intercollegiate sport from Title IX and then had failed to exempt football and men's basketball from Title IX coverage, the next best way to control the expenditures for women's athletics was to take over the governance of these programs and thereby control the expenditure policies pertaining to them. Whatever the reason, the NCAA made it impossible for AIW to continue and its doors were closed in June of 1982. So yet another very successful women's organisation was lost. Not only did women lose control of their own destiny in sport and the freedom to construct an alternate model of sport, women across the nation lost approximately 1,200 leadership opportunities that had been created by the AIW in the state, the regional, and the national structures. The result was that women who, for a decade, had enjoyed the leadership opportunities in the AIW and who had built a different type of organisation were now forced to live without vote in an organisation for which they did not vote and with a structure and a value system with which many did not agree. This was a heartbreakingly sad time for women in sport. Now I'd like to switch to national politics. In the early years of the 1980s, some writers began seriously researching the political voting patterns of men and women. And in a 1984 Newsweek article, it noted that, quote, women are raising a discernibly different political voice, more cautious and more compassionate than men. End of quote. Differences of op opinion between men and women were found in US involvement in war, defense spending, and nuclear policies, with women giving considerably less support to the continuation of war-like activi activities. Conversely, women were found to give significantly greater support for government solutions to the plight of the elderly and the poor in the nation, to sex discrimination, to the enforcement of civil rights laws, to employment, to the environmental problems, 
and to gun control. This political gap has persisted since the 1984 report. If it is true, as I believe, that many women have different priorities in their values, then it stands to reason that we must get women into decision-making positions in order to effectuate change. And that is the reason I strongly support 50-50 in 2020. Because if we want to have the values that women profess to have implemented into our society, there is no faster or more efficient way to do so than by having many more women at all levels of government. I must stress at this point that I would never ever advocate voting for a woman simply because of her gender. Women like men do not all have the same values. But I am ad advocating that when you do vote, you vote for women whose values are similar to your own. So where are we in this nation in our quest to have equitable representation of women in government? Women in the US Senate, 20%. The House, 18 US ranking for women in national governments, 78th out of 189 countries. Women in the Iowa Senate, 20%. Women in the House, 25%. These are not very good results for a nation that calls itself the greatest democracy that has ever existed. As you know, the current Congress in Washington has not been known for its bipartisanship, but in one visible show of bipartisanship, we currently have two women, a Democrat and a Republican, right now leading the way to present legislation to solve the rape crisis in our military. I don't think this bipartisanship is a coincidence. Violence against women is an area of concern to both Democratic and Republican women, and they are taking joint action to do something about it. If women had not taken up this issue and resolved to fix the problem, would it have been taken up at all? I doubt it. It's been my experience that when women are not at the decision-making table, issues of concern to them are not on the agenda. That is why we must significantly increase the representation of women in our governing structures at all levels. In my opinion, two of the most important pieces of legislation for women in the 20th century were, one, when women won the vote, the right to vote in 1920, and two, when Title IX was passed in 1972 prohibiting discriminatory practices in our educational institutions. Sometimes it seems as though people only think of sport when they think of Title IX. So I would like to show you the most important results of Title IX, and they have absolutely nothing to do with sport. Nineteen seventy-two, dental grads, women, one percent. By 1996, up to 36%. Medical grads, female, 9% to 41%. Law grads, 7% to 43%. Female PhDs, 14 to 40. And female faculty, 25 to 40. In the year 2010, these were the percentages of degrees conferred to females. Associate degrees, 62. Bachelor's, 57. Master's, 63. Doctorate's, 53. That is what Title IX did. Before Title IX, one of the reasons that was used to exclude women from leadership positions was that they did not have the education to be qualified for such positions, and that is no longer true. When given the opportunity, women raced towards the halls of academe and have soaked up the chances to, to learn. These results prove how effective Title IX has been in the elimination of so many discriminatory practices in our educational institutions, and that is why 
Title IX is so very, very important. However, I have spent my career trying to increase opportunities for girls and women in sport because I strongly believe that youngsters with the right coaches can learn as much, if not more, on a court or on a field because they can learn so much about themselves. I think a court or a field is a perfect laboratory for teaching, and I do not think it coincidental that playing sport and the development of leadership qualities is being researched by many who believe there is a very, very positive relationship between the two. Sport can teach you the invaluable lesson that although you lose today, if you pick yourself up and learn from the loss, you could win tomorrow. And that's an essential lesson for a youngster to learn. Because I'm a strong advocate for competitive sport for girls and women, I've kept uh, statistics on our progress. In the year 2012, it was the 40th anniversary of Title IX, and I was invited to several conferences to celebrate that progress. Frankly, I had a little difficulty in being the cheerleader, and I would like to show you why. The blue for the boys and the pink for the girls. Um, you can see that our female opportunities significantly went up very quickly. But you'll also notice that the opportunities for boys have risen greatly over the years. In fact, from 3.7 million now to 4.5 million. But the part that made it very difficult for me to talk about a celebration is the fact that the latest data show that girls at the high school level have 3.2 million slots participation. That's about half a million less than the boys had 40 years ago. Title IX is only asking our educational institutions to treat our daughters as well as our sons. And 40 years later, we still don't have anything close to equal opportunity at the high school level. At the collegiate level, in Division I, the percentage of female athletes is 46, but the percentage of the undergraduate female student body is 54. So there is an 8 percentage point difference. Now, you may think, well, 8% is nothing much. Well, actually, if, if, if you had a, an athletic program, say, with 550 total uh, participation slots, in order to be at your correct undergraduate ratio, you would have to add at least 38 participation slots, new slots. Now, that, that could constitute two more women's teams. However, the challenge facing Division I is nothing compared to the challenge facing Division II, where the difference is 17%. And in Division Three, it's 14%. And this is 42 years after Title IX was passed. Allocation of resources at the FBS. The FBS is what we used to call the 1A schools, the, the big schools, the, like the Big Ten Conference, etc. Student athletes. 55% to men and 45% to women. Total expenses, 72% to men, 28% to women. Recruiting expenses, 69 to 31. Scholarships, 58 to 42. 
head coaches salaries 75 to 25 and assistants 77 to 23. Because women have been totally frozen out as coaches of men's teams, and men have now assumed more than 60% of all head coaching positions in women's athletics, that translates to 80% of all intercollegiate head coaches are now men. And 80% of all athletic directors are men. Now, that's the bad news. But I do have some really good news. <laughs> and I want to leave you on a high note. <laughs> um, in this slide, look what happened after 1972. These are the numbers of women and men who participated in the Summer Olympic Games. In 1996, the women on the US Olympic team called themselves the Title IX Babies, and they walked away with an, an amazing number of medals. Their successes were definitely the result of the passage of Title IX and the wonderful sporting experiences that had been made available to them. That success of the American woman was not lost on the leaders of other nations who perhaps for the very first time realized that they too could increase their medal count if they developed the talents of women in their own countries. I don't care why they do it, it's just that they do it. <laughs> And what happened in 2012? For the very first time in history, every country that participated in the Olympic Games in London had at least one woman on its Olympic team. That was a phenomenal change. Phenomenal. And in the 212 Olympic Games, the American woman again excelled. US women, nearly two-thirds of all gold medals and nearly 60% of the total US medals were won by women. And for the first time in history, we sent a delegation that had more female athletes than male athletes, 281 to 271. So, while Title IX has vaulted American female athletes onto the world stage as essential and wonderfully successful members of the American team, it's also causing other nations to reconsider the role of women in sport in their own societies. That's what Title IX is currently doing. Perhaps, just perhaps, these countries are also beginning to think of how women's talents and abilities could be used in so many other areas in their cultures. And if these countries were to allow women to fully contribute their abilities, what an enormous and unbelievable contribution that would be by the USA to the women of this world. Think about it. I started with the concept that women may think differently from men, and I want to end with that concept again. When I look over my entire life, I realize I have had a, an absolutely unique experience of being involved in two vibrant and strong organizations that were developed by women and for women, and which had incorporated values that were different from, from organizations developed by men. So I wanted to convey to you today what I have concluded from my experiences, because I don't think many women have enjoyed the wonderful and unique experiences that I have enjoyed. 
When challenged by the status quo fairly early in my career, I think I was one of these women who believed that if I thought differently from men, I must be wrong. Now I know for certain that thinking differently is not wrong. And in fact, I am utterly convinced that women have an enormous amount of talent and creativity to positively contribute to this world and make it an infinitely better place for all who inhabit it. If I were to succinctly say why I feel so strongly about 50-50 in 2020, I would borrow a line from a song that was sung by Judy Collins. The song was called Bread and Roses. And the line is, the rising of the woman means the rising of the race. That is both my belief and my inspiration. Thank you.